In the world of events, uh, my role tonight is that of kind of a palate cleanser. Um, I have all care but no responsibility. Uh, my job is to provide a pithy introduction to the subject uh, and to open the door to the panel to enable uh, discussion and debate. Um, and to this end, I think we should acknowledge that tonight's event wouldn't occur without the team at FJC. So thank you for the team at FJC in particular, and in particular, Richard. Um, uh, during COVID, while I was deciding how to, the right amount of um, zest I could get from the orange for my Negroni, three o'clock Negroni, um, Richard was writing a book, which, you know, says something. Um, so at this time and in this place, the fly that has been circling a deep wound in our nation's consciousness has become stuck in the ointment further soiling the weeping cesspit that is white Australia's relationship with the original custodians of this place. Consciousness is the act of awareness and the capacity to respond to that awareness. In retrospect, as a nation, we are perhaps unconscious, passed out, drowned in the embarrassment of natural riches that we've stolen, unable or unwilling to wake from our drunken slumber to face up to the massive clean-up that awaits. Consciousness and architecture in this place could be positioned to be rooted in the sentinel of the bush, that kind of collective well-being of country. Imagine if, as our First Nations people do, we acknowledge the consciousness of the gum that has stood looking across the grasslands for hundreds of years. If instead of negating its consciousness, we rerouted the highway or perhaps even still never built it in the first place. If, as Stan Grant contends, architecture is an act of creative violence, our awareness of place and the potential of making it through the lens of architecture is also rooted in the act of destruction. Are they polar opposites? Are we to actively listen to our consciousness and stop making, but for the outcome to be chronic homelessness? If indeed the most sustainable building is the building that never leaves the page, what is it to become, what is to become of our profession? a profession charged with giving physicality to the ambitions of our communities, of making space to accommodate democracy? Are we simply barking up the wrong tree? So, to navigate tonight's discussion, um, I don't really need to introduce um, Anthony Burke. Um, he is pretty much the equivalent of Jamie Oliver to architecture. <laughs> he's loved by the screen, um, and he's the host of Restoration Australia, and now Grand Designs, and now Grand Designs Renovations, which is Amazing and uh, amazing. Um, he also happens to be a professor of architecture, just kind of as a side note, um, at UTS. So to show that he's comfortable across all the spectrums of the public realm and to be kind of excited by that, my mum knows who he is, so I think that's pretty <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> um, so over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, look, thanks, Adam. That's very generous of you. I think we have a word from Cathy from Think Freak. Correct? Yeah. You're the next person, and then I'll introduce our panellists. Is that all right? That's right. You ready for this? I'll just be very brief. All right, we're ready for you. Go for Thank it. you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Think Brick is sponsored tonight, and welcome, let me add your welcome to here tonight. Um, when I read the chapter in the book, I was fascinated, and at the start of it, what does a brick want to be? I'm, I'm the CEO of the Brick Industry Association, so I know what a brick wants to be. <laughs> a brick wants to be anything you want it to be. You're the architect, and a brick can do anything, and that's the most fabulous thing about a brick. So a brick does want to be an arch. A brick wants to be a cantilevered wall. A brick wants to be a hit and miss wall. But if you want to know what, how to do that, and you have um, no idea how to do that, that's where Think Brick can come in. Many of you will know Think Brick, we run an awards program and have for, I think it's 18 years now. I'm a region CEO, so I'm only just involved, but it has been running for many years. So the Think Brick Awards program is well known through the architecture community, but we do a lot more than that. We do research, we provide technical resources to the industry, and when you want to know how to put that brick in the arch, you give us a call and we can help you with that. So I'd like to add my welcome all to you tonight, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cathy. And you got the Dorothy Dixon, didn't you? What does the brick want to be? Yeah, what a setup! Oh my goodness. Uh, it's great to see you all here this evening. Thank you all for coming for the second instalment of these talks. 
these talks were designed, and I can say that quite seriously, literally designed, to try and find a different conversation in architecture from the one that we're generally having out there. Space where ideas that we would not normally have the time for are uh, given some time. And tonight is a cracker. How the hell are we going to talk about consciousness? Oh my goodness. I was looking that up just before I got here. There are at least seven definitions of consciousness from the disciplines who actually spend their time thinking about this stuff. So what have a bunch of architects got to say about that? Never let that be a problem for us. We're going to have a crack at it. Um, and the will of the architects, boy, we, we haven't got long enough to really get into all of this. So, but tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to have uh, our panellists will give a short address to outline their positions, then they will join us up here on the stage, and then we'll have a discussion. And after that, we'll open up to you, dear audience, to join us in that discussion. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we'll see how that goes. My job is just to keep things moving along. So, very brief introductions. Um, Shannon, you have just met. Where's Shannon? She's up there, right here. Yeah. Shannon, you've met, so I won't have to reintroduce her. William Smart is here this evening. Thank you for joining us, William. Uh, and Elizabeth Farrelly is also here. And I'm not going to spend a long time on the bios because I think we all know these lovely, intelligent, wonderful people, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. So with that in mind, before I give the floor to you three, Richard, your turn up here to really set the scene for us. And again, thank you from all of us for being the driving force behind all of this. The lectern is yours. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Anthony, and uh, also um, thank you, Adam. So over COVID, um, yeah, I wrote this book. I actually also spent a lot of time watching Netflix, like everyone else, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and, I, and I wrote this book, and I thought uh, it's a collection of essays, and there's a kind of um, dialectic going on in this uh, book between, the, between architecture and the architect between the nature of architecture and the nature of the architect. Um, and this is one of those. Uh, and I thought I'd better explain that because I thought maybe there's one or two people in the audience who haven't actually read the book. <laughs> so the consciousness of architecture and the will of the architect. And this is also a tribute to our sponsors as there seems to be no better place to begin than with the brick which we have been using for thousands of years. Here's mud brick at Koya from 7,400 BC, uh, and then it was used for the first time in fired form in 3,500 BC. So it, we've been using it for a long time, <clears throat> but how do we use it? And for guidance on bricks, perhaps um, before we turn to Cathy, we should turn to the words of the great American architect, Louis Kahn. And... He says, if you think of brick, you say to brick, what do you want, brick? And brick says, I like an arch. And you say to brick, look, our arches are expensive and I can use good concrete lintel over you. What do you think of that, brick? Um, and brick rather predictably says, I like an arch. Um, and Khan goes on to say that it's important, you see, that you honour the material that you use. You can only do it if you honour the brick and glorify the brick instead of shortchanging it. Now, on one level, these famous words from Khan are deeply unhelpful and perhaps even do a disservice to our professional credibility. I mean, it's not very helpful in conversations with bricklayers or builders on a construction <laughs> site to bring up the wishes and likes and dislikes of bricks. Neither is it helpful in conversation with engineers or clients to explain that bricks prefer arches to lintels. <laughs> The very idea that architects actually talk to bricks would only seem to reinforce the perception that we are a deluded profession. <laughs> and I would only have the courage to begin a talk with such a quote if I was in a room full of architects. <laughs> but on another level, these words from Khan are deeply profound and go beyond the limits of architecture because they lead us to the question of the nature of consciousness. Consciousness is what it is to be you, that internal experience, that awareness of options in life with the associated hopes and anxieties, the authorship of decisions and the consequences that follow. That sense you are unique and have agency over your life. We seem to confidently take our consciousness for granted. 
It is simply what it is to be me or what it is to be you. But consciousness has long been something of a blind spot in our science. Where is it? How does it work? And why is it so opaque to scientific investigation, so elusive and mysterious? Is it even real? Maybe it's just a deceit within an otherwise detectable and measurable processes within our minds. But no, surely it must be real. It's what it is to be a person, and without it we would be empty. Consciousness seems to be hard to deny, but also easy to ignore. It is easy to intuit, but very hard to explain. In recent years, we have seen a renewed focus on how consciousness can be explained and how central it may be to our understanding of our world and the nature of our existence. Perhaps there is also a sense of urgency in understanding consciousness be more beyond a mere human consciousness as we try to come to terms with the ethical and environmental issues of our time, as we try to understand how we value forms of life or even define life itself extending it not only to the breadth of the natural world and natural systems, but to our own transformations of the world in the form of our inventions, automations, manufacturings, and particularly in the form of our artificial intelligence. These questions, confrontations, and challenges are all pressing our limited definition of consciousness. In the modern world, we have tended to divide its inhabitants into two groups, those possessing consciousness and those who do not. Or more, more simply put, persons and things. Persons are afforded significant protections and rights, while non-persons or things are assigned almost none and are viewed in purely instrumental terms, their existence relegated to their use value by the first group. They are there to be used and used up. The boundary between these two groups is surprisingly subtle and relies on relatively small differences. Certain human beings themselves have been, have been pushed into the second group of things based on a difference that is very fine, such as the color of skin, shape of eyes, gender, or even non-physical attributes, such as language or beliefs. Once fallen into the category of things, where almost no rights or protections are assigned, there is little impediment to the consequential exploitation, brutalization, and degradation that the perceived absence of consciousness seems to invite. While this fall for human beings into the group of non-conscious things is generally now viewed as inaccurate, abhorrent, and morally wrong, the difference of life species remains an easy and generally acceptable distinction. It seems to matter little that the subspecies also have many attributes in common with the category of persons, such as eyes, faces, bodies, the experience of pain, emotions, and the formation of family and social bonds. These subspecies of life are viewed as mere things and afforded little relative protections or rights their social and family bonds are entirely unrecognized and they are unnecessarily and unsustainably exploited on an industrial scale as a preferred food choice by the first group. Beyond animal life species, as the matter of the world slides into forms of less perceived consciousness, such as insects, trees, rivers and bushland, there is no question or consideration of assigned life rights. These are without doubt mere things, devoid of consciousness to be served up for our manipulation, exploitation and use. What then of the instruments we have fashioned out of the lifeless matter of the world, the machines and systems we have invented and bent to our purpose and will, and shaped into anthropomorphic forms, processes and now perhaps even intellects? Into which group do they belong? And if our expansive accumulated sources of collective values, histories, politics, laws, conduct, and everything else we see fit to put on the internet 
both good and bad, light and dark, noble and hateful, are their guide, what will we have taught them? And where will they draw the line of life rights that we ourselves seem to have drawn in purely self-serving patterns of inadequate ethical substance? Where will they draw the line that should never have been drawn? And what damage, pain and suffering will ensue? The category of persons and things and the associated primacy of the first group seems unhelpful and all too quickly exposes our ethical and maybe even our existential limitations. Our definition of consciousness seems similarly narrow, limited and flawed. We are searching for tools and instruments to navigate our way through a life territory where our sight is weak and the land full of crevices. But there are some important and confronting concepts that may help guide us through this territory. One of the most challenging and difficult to grasp is panpsychism, a term from the Greek pan, meaning everything or whole, and psyche, mind and soul. This concept that consciousness is not exclusively a human or animal attribute, but in varying degrees is present in all things. Sentience is in some form ubiquitous and exists throughout the natural world and in all our human reworkings of this world. This is a concept that stands in contrast with modern scientific materialism, which has informed so much of our effective and efficient understanding of the world and has in many ways got us where we are today, for good and perhaps also ill. Nevertheless, panpsychism has a long history in human thought, from Plato's entire world as a living being endowed with soul and intelligence, Spinoza's monism, and Schopenhauer's extension of inner essence. There is a rich line of modern thinking in panpsychism. And in more recent times, the Australian philosopher David Chalmers has suggested that it is a potential response to what he has termed the hard problem of consciousness, the mystery of awareness that seems to underpin our experience of the world. But it remains a challenging concept as it seems to question not only our scientific materialism, which has little use or purpose for the immateriality of conscious souls, but also our Judeo-Christian tradition that preferences humanity above all other forms of animal and natural life which are to be served up for human use. In the words of God, it's rare to have the opportunity to quote God, from Genesis 9.2 to 3, the fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you green plants, now I give you everything. God has a lot to answer for. We know that. But surely we must now question the singularity of God's words, just as we might question the singular truth of scientific materialism. Rather than separate ourselves from nature, objectifying it for instrumental use, an environmental philosophy of empathy that extends sentiments deep into the natural world, in many ways supported by indigenous thought and philosophy, is more intuitive and natural to our own sense of being. It is surely the natural insight of our children, the same insight that is central to the art and nature of the craft of architecture. And it is hardly surprising, therefore, that all children are architects. Every child intuitively knows what it takes us years to reteach them as adults, to see the life in making. Architecture is the giving of life to building, or perhaps more accurately, the uncovering of life in the transformation of a site. This recognition of consciousness extension is inherent in the very creative act. When we design with empathy and sincerity, it is not a willful act of determination, but a discovery and a following of a life outside of our own. We may launch a project with a sense of direction or aspiration, but must quickly get in the boat 
and accept the course it sets for us, follow its nature and path. This is the flow, the acceptance that the creative act is not our agency, but exercised through us. As architects, we're used to thinking about consciousness within architecture, of finding a form that embodies social purpose and aspirations, of imbuing architecture with life. Even simple material units architects imbue with life or mind. Take, for instance, the most basic unit of construction, the brick, pressed and moulded from the earth and clay on which we stand. Its properties and dimension and dimensions are determined in relation to our own body and our ability to hold its weight and, and its proportions in one hand. We form this unit, assemble it into enclosures and walls, and then at some point step back and ponder its nature and intent, perhaps even its life and ambitions. Louis Kahn's fam famously asked, what does a brick want to be? Is it in the asking of this question that the builder becomes an architect when we see life and consciousness beyond our own designer willfulness? And if this is the insight that makes us architects with insights of a child relearned, how is it lost so easily? Is it simply when we forget to ask the question anew on each and every project as we gradually come to believe that there is no question to be asked? Consciousness receding back into only us, only me and my will observing only an object with no material depth or life of its own. Is this when the architect falls and becomes merely a conjurer of images, when we fail to see the nature of the brick and the transcendence of form, when we are merely beguiled by the shape and the passing popularity of the arch to fail to see the life in matter? How could we forsake the insight at the very heart of our profession and our art? Perhaps it is like the inevitable loss of innocence of a child as the joy and the life in nature of the world is buried under the struggle for identity, self-awareness, worldliness and cynicism. A contemporary architect similarly buried under the proliferation of images, the reductive speed and processes of production and the exploitative commodification of our work. Architecture is reduced to a consumer object, in and passing in its appeal, interest and use. The immeasurable is overwhelmed by the measurable. And to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, we seem to know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Whereas once as children we saw life, now we only see use. Could we learn Again, to see consciousness not as a purely human attribute and right, but as present in some form in the natural world and in all our transformations of this world around us. Would we then think of ourselves not as merely me, but as part of an extended network of consciousness, of life? When we fail to see the consciousness in the natural world around us, we no longer see the life in the trees, the bushlands, insects and animal life. We become, we become blind to the network of consciousness that empathetically interconnects us with the world and life around us. And we treat the natural world as a mere resource for exploitation. And finally, when we're on the threshold of an environmental catastrophe, we miss the point and we still want to measure our way out of it with data and analysis of what can be endured and what level of suffering is sustainable. Little wonder then that our children who have yet to learn our reductionist indifference to consciousness beyond our own feel we are missing the point and feel betrayed. Rather than more, learn more technique, measurement, calculation and engineering, the most important task for the architect is to see what is beyond measurement, to see and to then make visible the consciousness in the natural world, to look through the eyes of a lost childhood at the life in everything around us. So in returning to the brick, if we are interested in it beyond a mere instrumental use, if we are curious about its, na about its nature and think it may have some form of consciousness, we should be cautious our use of the arch. 
If Cohen was right, and the arch is the ultimate aspiration of the brick, then it is the most honourable and transcendental form. But it is not ours. It is beyond our willfulness and belongs only to the brick. So we should look for the life in the brick and be sure to ask the question again and make sure this time and place it is for the brick. And be careful to ask at this moment which form it wishes to take. And I would like to end with a quote from the turn of the century inventor and futurist Nikola Tesla. Even matter called inorganic, believed to be dead, responds to irritants and gives unmistakable evidence of a living principle within. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Wow. Um, what an opener. From God to children, matter and life in everything. Panpsychism is the phrase. Yeah. Everything has consciousness, and it sounds like empathy. That is, recognition is prerequisite for the empathy of the architect to be able to actually work. What a setup. I don't envy your role, can I? <laughs> and with that, Shannon, would you like to come and offer the first response? Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's a hard act to follow, right? <laughs> um, is somebody going to give me a warning on time? Because I'll talk for hours, um, <laughs> as you all know. <laughs> but I'll try to be quick. Um, so the brick wants to be an arch. And the arch is the universal symbol of the female creation space. Yeah? And yet the brick does not fit the female hand. How do we make our creation space? if the brick isn't fit for our purpose. And so when I think of consciousness, I think of what scholarship and what academia will call standpoint. You know, we go back to Marxism and the relationships between workers and employees and that the employee has a much broader and better understanding of the employer than the other way around. Because the employer does not have to know necessarily about the employee. The employee needs to know about the employer because they need to know what motivates them and what will make them happy and be able to get money and the things that you need from them. So that's a basic understanding of Standpoint 101, which then led, obviously, to women standing up and saying, wait a minute, this is not just about... And men don't, are the only ones that don't have a standpoint. Women do too, and it's very different, very, very different. And then Indigenous people came along and said, wait a minute, this isn't just about being the standard Anglo-Saxon, white, Western, educated. There's also a whole range of other people. And that's where the story gets interesting, where it comes to consciousness. Because we stand here and we say that country is an entity. Country is a person. Country is our mother. Our mother. And that's a lot. And that's how we have survived here for so many tens of thousands of years without running out of anything living completely sustainably because we treat Earth and her resources as our mother because that is how we stay alive. And we don't fight over mother. My brother has the same mother. It's her mother, his mother too. We have an ownership of her in a title, but we don't own her and tell her what to do and how to do it. And that's what we do with country. Country is a person, it's an entity, it has consciousness as a collective, which we're all part of, but also as individual parts. But where does that leave us here today, sitting in this room, this constructed, built form, that has absolutely extracted from the earth and everything it can get to make the space? How does our consciousness sit with that? How do we feel when we see the rows and rows of carcasses in a pig farm? It's jarring. Where do we go from here? Where is consciousness going to take us? You know, we have this understanding that, yes, we must protect the earth. We can't eat, drink or breathe money. So what to now? Where now? We consciously know we can't keep doing this. We consciously know this is not the way forward. So then what? How are we going to unite our consciousness with the earth consciousness? How are we going to accept that, yes, 
we are, I'm sure one day we'll look back and go, I can't believe we ever treated animals like that. In the same ways that we look back and go, I can't ever believe we accepted slavery. Are we still accepting slavery today though? We are. So where to from here? Where's consciousness going to take us? Where is the understanding that the people working in factories in another country thousands and thousands of kilometres away have a consciousness too? That in some of our clothes, if you pull apart the seams, there will be notes in there from the person who made it saying, please help me. That's the truth of our consciousness and our material relationship with the earth. We are taking, 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 taking. And it's got to stop. But how? What do we do next? How, where do we go from here? How can we possibly overcome this guilt, the shame, everything that comes with it, the responsibility of having consciousness and of knowing and believing and understanding and witnessing that everything out there has consciousness? Everything. Every animal, every insect, every leaf, every stone. Just because the frequency may be vibrating lower than our own doesn't mean it's any less important. Where do we go? I wish I had an answer for you all. But reading chapters like Richard's helps me to understand that I'm not alone in these thoughts, that I am not the only one thinking these things, that there is a collective enlightenment happening that there is a change. And then when you see things like connecting with country frameworks and you see that actually, I've been shocked every day of my working life that actually we can propose these outlandish things for the sake of saving a tree or for the sake of, you know, looking after country and keeping country safe and protected. And people say, yes, okay. Okay, and we do it. And I'm, just, I'm amazed, I'm astounded, and I'm astonished. And our biggest biggest I guess set back with one thing that stops us in our work is always the budget the money and that's I think where we have to start making real change is how much do we let money influence what we're doing we can't eat drink or breathe it this is not a human habitat this is why we're not happy this is why we don't feel comfortable in a space like this and in living in their life like this when COVID hit National Parks and Wildlife Visitation went up 80%. It's a reason why that's a human habitat. That's where we go to. That's where we run when the chips are down. If the, I, I've spent many years working at the zoo and we've spent so much time making the enclosures just what the animals needed. And then I think about where we are and what we're doing now and I think if we were a zoo, the RSPCA would shut us down. <laughs> So we have to think about human habitats. People think you have to sacrifice money and it's going to cost money in order to connect to country. It's not. What it's going to do is actually create human habitats that people want to come to and people will bring their wallets and it will affect the bottom line, but in positive ways. I think I'm just going to leave you there. This is just getting more and more interesting by the second. William Smart, this is your turn to speak. William Smart, creative director and founder of William Smart Design Studios. Welcome. It's a, a great honour to be here amongst such great thinkers. And I can see that each person has a different perspective on architecture. So this perspective that I bring forward tonight is that of the practitioner. It's a very broad subject, as we've heard an introduction to today, and we could take many different approaches. But for our practice, and for me, it means three things. Place, atmosphere, and responsibility. Place. I'd just like to start with a, a quote from Glenn Merkid, who's here tonight. Place is everything to me. It's the most important thing about understanding architecture. To know your own place is to know how to build and how to work with the culture. I believe that buildings should be very conscious of their place. They must relate to the land, to the city, to historical buildings, to neighbours and to their environment. And when Richard suggested the talk about consciousness of architecture, I had a mental image of a mirrored glass box. And that was, for me, of unconscious architecture. 
Personally, I respect architecture that makes great cities and reinforces what's unique about a great place, such as these examples here. Atmosphere. Peter Zumtho says, we perceive atmosphere through our emotional sensibility, a, a form of perception that works incredibly quickly. The task of conscious architecture is to create a place for emotional expression and to stimulate a heightened sense of self-awareness of body and mind through experience. Our memories of past places influence our experience of new places and subsequently inform meaning. For us, creating the right atmosphere is critical to our practice. We use light, shadow, material and form to manipulate an atmosphere. We consider the atmosphere, we discuss it, we curate it. Curate it. And lastly, I'd like to talk about responsibility. This is my personal consciousness right now and a, a new focus of our practice. I believe that mankind needs toilet training. I believe the building industry needs toilet training. And I think architects need toilet training too. Training is to clean up after ourselves and training is to not make waste along the way. We are custodians of this place for this time. We need to look after it and be responsible for that. Architects have huge potential here to lead towards solutions. We design, we draw, specify, say and do. And what we say and do will impact so many other people up and down the line of the construction path. Mind, uh, the consciousness for me is a mind-bending uh, subject. It's so broad, it's so deep, and it's such an incredible concept. I wonder how much can we all take on? Um, and uh, our next speaker, to put the last uh, flag in the sand, if you like, uh, before we move to the panel discussion, is, um, how do I introduce you, Elizabeth? <laughs> Writer, critic, advocate, counsellor, independent member for parliament, um, someone who has written their way around the world uh, through books, journal articles, critical reviews, etc., etc. Elizabeth Farrelly, welcome. Um, thank you, Anthony, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, now I'm going to attempt to say Buduri Gamoru, which I believe is hello, uh, or Warami, uh, also, uh, that I stand to be corrected, no doubt, in my pronunciation, but I would like, uh, as other speakers have, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadi people, um, including women. Uh, to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal people here this evening. Um, my, let me see if I can, <laughs> uh, many of you will know this image, I trust. There are many things to love, I would say, in Richard's essay, The Consciousness of the Architect. Honestly, though, I have to say, and I mean no offence to our honourable sponsor, I don't think it's about the brick. I love, in Richard's essay, the idea of design as discovery, and I quote, the uncovering of life and the transformation of a site. I love the idea of architecture not as, and again I quote, a willful act of determination, but as a discovery and a following of a life outside our own. I love the idea of following that path, of discovering rather than creating architecture, because it implies a curiosity and a fluid, responsive imagination. In turn, I think that suggests a loss of ego. I'm reminded uh, of Keats, John Keats, the poet's um, idea of what he called negative capability, which, uh, by which he meant that the sense of being able to lose yourself in the presence of the other he was talking at the time about a nightingale, as you might remember. Um, Sidney Nolan's early childhood memory <clears throat> was uh, of standing in the school playground, uh, parade ground, I guess. Uh, uh, it sounds like a military kind of school. Anyway, as a child, 
And he said, I, uh, he was overcome by, and again I quote, a streaming feeling that while you were standing there looking at the sky, something was rushing through you at an enormous rate, forming you and giving you all your real messages. For me, this Ned Kelly image of um, Sidney Nolan's from 1946, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, suggests the same kind of thing because he shows here, as he does often in this series and elsewhere, the, uh, the presence of Ned Kelly, who, if anything, was an ego as, as also transparent, transparent to the universe. It's almost, it's like the sky is going right through him. Um, and I've always loved that about these paintings. It reminds me too of, uh, there's a phenomenon called kinesis, which was experienced by Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, of a self-emptying, that loss of self, the, the absence, the emptying out of ego. And I have to say, and again, I mean no insult to architects here, that any loss of ego within the architecture profession would be refreshing. <laughs> Um, I'm sure that doesn't apply to anyone in this room. Um, to all these things, the loss of ego, the end of architecture as object, the demise of masculinism, and the jettisoning, jettisoning of what I call the great man view of architecture, I'm going to say resoundingly yes to all of those. Uh, to pantheism, or if you prefer, panpsychism, to oneness with nature, uh, to caring for country, of course, and to full recognition of the other. But still, I don't think it's really about the brick. It may not surprise you to know that I take some issue with Louis Kahn, um, who we often see as the kind of soft end of modernism, the, the nice guy of all those big egos, because of the poetic aphorisms that he throws up. <laughs> But uh, forgive me for being sceptical, I still regard him as an exponent of the great man uh, school of architectural thought, which is, in my book, the exact opposite of ego loss. In many ways, despite postmodernism and post-structuralism and all the other fads and isms that we've been through, <clears throat> all of which promised to end uh, architecture's colonial mindset, architecture is still broadly speaking, the reification of ego. I'm astonished that we're still having these conversations, to be honest. Um, to my mind, a near complete intellectual and theoretical vacuum um, has resulted uh, and sort of reigns now so that the hardest thing I imagine for architects, luckily I don't do this anymore, um, is, is that question when faced with uh, what you might call still a blank page, where do you put the line? You know, in the absence of theory, and um, uh, which guided, of course, modernism very strongly and a few other of the isms, where do you put the line? I th and I think the idea of um, Brick having a will, Kahn's idea of that, was an attempt to answer that question, probably, by appealing to a kind of truth, a truth in architecture. Um, as he said, architecture is the reaching out for a truth. We like that thought, of course. Architects are very fond of this notion that somehow we can build truth. Um, there are many traditions of, of this kind of pursuit of truth. There's truth to tradition, classicism, but also modernism, and also Ruskin's true and pointed Christian architecture, the Gothic. There's truth to geometry. I think of people like John Andrews, you might still remember, um, with you know hexagons and octagons everywhere. There's truth to climate, which is usually called regionalism. There's truth to the zeitgeist, which of course drove Harry Seidler very strongly, and others like Wagner in Vienna. There's truth via transparency, a very literalist idea that if you can see through it, it's kind of truthful, um, which drove Mies and also Philip Johnson and lots of those guys, and still makes us want to put glass everywhere. There's truth via craft, the, the maidenness of architecture, the handcraftedness. And you think of people like Semper, but also Lethaby and also William Morris, and made the whole made fashion, which is back to some extent. And there's truth to materials, of course. And we think of Kahn and his beloved brick. Um, 
Mostly, though, I would say that this supposed pursuit of truth has ended as a guise for the will of the architect. Um, and that's, there's, that's really difficult to avoid because architecture is a hugely volitional act. Shepherding your design through the thorny thickets of councils, engineers, builders, and all the rest of it requires enormous will and, I would suggest, ego, not to mention totalitarian levels of self-belief, <laughs> <laughs> which is why some of the greatest pieces of architecture are actually uninhabitable. Uh, how do I do this? Like that. For example, architecture is the masterly, correct and magnificent play of masses brought together in light, said Corb. But this house, of course, is now the property of the French state and rarely inhabited. Um, there's this. Uh, architects must be, the architect said Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, falling water obviously, um, must be a prophet in the true sense. The truth is more important than the facts. Uh, this house also uninhabited uh, and uninhabitable in fact. Um, was voted the most, the best all-time work of American architecture by an AIA poll, um, not our AIA, theirs, um, nevertheless uninhabitable. And this one, of course, <laughs> which we all love because it's extremely beautiful. Um, God, after all, said Mies, is in the details. But, <laughs> you know, Edith Farnsworth, for whom this house was designed, said she couldn't take off her clothes and there was no, nowhere to put the bin and <laughs> refused to live here and no one has lived here since. It also floods horribly and is full of mosquitoes but you're not allowed to put up fly screens for obvious reasons that ruin the details. Uh, and of course this house. Again, a beautiful thing uh, to each time it's art, said Harry Seidler. This is the Rose Seidler House, 1947. All these houses roughly around the same time but now a museum also. My point is simply that there's no accident here. These are still regarded by a lot of us as the iconic houses of modernism. And I think it's no accident that these are the iconic houses and they are great houses and they're also uninhabitable for that reason, arguably. Because, <laughs> because to be great, you have to be unflinching in your pursuit of the diagram, and that actually doesn't take very much notice of <laughs> anything else, uh, including the humans. So, <laughs> so, so we come back to the question of where do you put the line? You know, how do we make architecture? And is it important to be great architecture in this sense? I think Richard is absolutely right that we need deeply to reconceive the power relationship between humans and nature and to understand ourselves as an inextricable part of the ecosystem, less object than subject, and less machine than conduit. Architecture <coughs> is a wrapping of the human spirit, a vestment that we make from nature in order to protect ourselves from nature. But I think we need to start to understand how to do this in a way that not only protects us from nature, but also protects nature from us. And that involves a kind of reciprocity, which I think the other speakers have all been also talking about. So to my mind, it's less about the brick, which is already under human control and already a symbol of human agency, um, than about that sense of continuity with and discontinuity from the air and the waters, the sky, the creatures of the soil and the vast teeming, terrifying mass of wetware we call humanity. Uh, so, Janu, au revoir, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, where, how are we going to start this? Let's start with where do we put the line, Elizabeth's okay. challenge, and I'm going to throw to you, William, as the self-proclaimed practitioner in the room. <laughs> where do you put the line? I guess um, it's, it's, it's often a very hard thing to start, isn't it? Like to start a design process and where do you think about it? Um, uh, I think what I try to do before 
thinking about the line is probably to think about purpose really of a project and to try to articulate in my mind what it is that we're trying to do. Now, that requires a line actually before a building. So uh, I love that kind of idea of drawing to discover um, and that's probably what I try to think around with pen and paper and I love drawing and just to kind of rather than think about what's the building going to be like to think about what's the purpose of the building and the opportunity and the challenge that, that sits in front of us and then to work really around that. So the first line is symbolic act. You're looking to try and define the nature of the brief rather than any formal response. Yes, or to uh, to pick apart the brief to know what the problem might be. Shannon, do we even start with a line? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a song line. <laughs> oh, too sure. Did you see that? That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> I'm not usually this this late at night. Um, <laughs> it's been a champagne. Um, it definitely starts with country. I think that's where... You, anyone should go, especially if they're struggling with thoughts, ideas, but getting out onto country, particularly the country that you're working with, and it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the city and covered in concrete and look at it, investigate it. Probably the first line I think of is going onto maps and looking at the satellite pictures and the terrain and the, they're the lines that I'm looking at and thinking about what's country doing here, what should it be doing, what isn't it doing, what was it doing, what will it be doing. It's just always about country and then... A layering on that is talking to elders, looking at the ancestral stories, thinking about what ways in which country can be highlighted and and really, you know, I think about protection and things like that, but I also think about, you know, country's got its own enduring spirit and what's its in spirit, what's its spirit here, what has it always been to us, what do we know about it, how has it performed and all of those things. And the funny, craziest thing is, without you even knowing it, is that future developments and things actually reflect that enduring spirit. So we're finding healing spaces are becoming hospitals. We're finding, you know, and, and then this is, you know, completely, you know, maybe it's the stars aligning or whatever it is. We're not saying, oh, this is a healing space, so you must put the hospital here. We are in our investigations finding, wow, this is where this story belongs and this is what it's all about. So if this then is an architecture that we should reject mm -hmm. and we can always learn from country... Do we have anything to teach country? No. <laughs> so the Definitely building architect not. in that space does no. not have a place at all? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Okay. <laughs> what would you say? What I would say is that architects are artists. <laughs> they're poets, they're creators, and I think that's something that we've sort of removed from architecture. I think architecture gets, well, the architects get sort of conflated with the bean counters and the people who say yes and no to things and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if we tap into that child that Richard speaks about, if we tap into our true, honest humanity, our creativity and everything is what we can bring to country to work with country. Country can't learn anything from us. It made us. It knows every single part of thing, everything about us. It keeps us alive. Richard, where does the architect sit in all of this? Well, the problem is that you, if you haven't drawn a line, you can't ask it where it wants to go. Um, so I think the mistake here is um, in our language, actually. Right? The mistake is trying to draw a line, actually authoring the line. That's the mistake you can make. Um, and all of us uh, have that challenge, you know, because you think, where am I going to draw the line? And then you'll draw it and you think, well, that's wrong. Or you'll think, that's exactly right. Both are the wrong answer. So you can only follow the line. In that case, it's a process of discovery and, and, and exploration, right? So you never draw the line. You draw a whole lot. And they're all wrong. And they're all right. Yeah. So it's just like uh, for, for the architect, it's a journey. It's a journey of discovery. And if we have any skills, it is not anything to bring a value. We're not engineers. We're not mathematicians. We're not scientists. We haven't got all the data... We, you know, we, can't, we may as well hand it over to someone else to solve all these problems. What we can find is the life that's there. Yeah. And we find it through our being. Yeah. Oh, look, I love the idea of the architect and the child in all of us, and we should get back to that, and that's great. But, Elizabeth, that's not going to fly at the city of Sydney. <laughs> How does a three-year-old walk into a council meeting and, and make a case? 
Um, yeah, look, I'm... Uh, first of all, I want to say, I think this is a really good building. This building is big. Kind of copped out of I'm not knocking the building at all. It's a building form. Yeah, well, it, no, but it's a, it's a fine building, and I think it's fine because it responds in what I would actually say is a fairly feminine way to place. Um, and it's always a delight to be here. <laughs> so, just for the record. Um, <laughs> look, I do think w we... Y it, there's a temptation to talk um, in the very kind of spiritual way but life is a practical business at least in part and being an architect in particular which thank heavens I'm not trying to do but I do think it is caught up with all of those practicalities and it is important to recognize that you can't just go along and say as, as Richard said before you know this is what the brick wants <laughs> I mean you can't even go along and say at the council this is the better way to do it because it's beautiful like even that level no way so you and I think that is part of the problem because architects pretty much culturally learn at their, you know, from year one to fib. I'm going to try not to be too rude, but uh, it's always about cloaking what you really believe and what you really think and what you really know to be your real reasons for doing things in this kind of practical coating, which is actually kind of bullshit. And it... Like, it leaves you vulnerable because then all the um, engineer or the council officer has to say is, well, that's not, that's rubbish, you know, or I can fix that, and then you've got no legs to stand on. So it seems to me that actually, as a profession, we all need to get braver about what we really believe and stand for and um, talk about it in a way that is... That, because, it, because architecture is, after all, about improving life, and improving life has to involve responding to country, but also making cities that don't go on sprawling and eating up bushland and all the rest of it. So we know all that. But I think we need to talk about that much more boldly and in a way that's about values and not about quantities. William, have you been fibbing lately? I, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it's so true. I mean, I was in a conversation today about quality versus quantity. You know, just so, saying to someone... You need to measure the quality of this project in order to balance that with the quantity of the metrics that it's giving you, because they're chasing two square metres of, you know, part of the building that's not going to bring any benefit at all, and the cost of that is very high to the project. Now it's a hard, it's a hard conversation, and it doesn't, you know, normally it's a, it falls pretty flat, but you're still going to give it a go. Like just quality is, is real. It's pretty hard to convey with a line and on a drawing as well. Yeah. But are we cloaking ourselves, as Elizabeth suggesting, in a, I don't know, a rubric, a, a language which is inherently false as a discipline? Then back to Shannon's point, what can we... We can't teach country anything, but we've got a lot to learn. It sounds like we're starting off on a very difficult footing if we've got that you know, disingenuous relationship from the get-go. Yeah, uh, look, I think... Um, uh, all of us, or most most of us here probably tonight, uh, might think of ideas and concepts and, you know, many layers of a project. And uh, to get a project across the line, for a lot of people, that's just some stuff that you put on the side. Mm. You don't need to, you don't need to take that to a council meeting and say, my idea, mm. or the idea for the project, or its relationship to the sky is this. It's just... You've got to get to the facts. That's the way you sell it. That's the way that the people who are making the assessment understand the project. With that in mind, Shannon, like you know, architecture is a willful act. You know, it takes, as Elizabeth pointed out, it takes a lot to motivate people, politics, material, regulations towards any outcome. How do we act then? If the line is not the solution and country is listening but not really, how do we act? Oh my God, that is like, thanks for the yeah, hardest no question of all. <laughs> Here comes my, eight, you know, nine o'clock on a Wednesday night brain. Um, I, how do we act? That's a, such a good question. I think the issues lie in money, the root of all evil and all of that. <laughs> money definitely squashes creativity. What did we all do in COVID? I keep going back to that. But what did we do? We created, we wrote, we painted, we crocheted, we did jigsaw puzzles for the hell of it. Like, that's our humanity. 
this grind, this, you know, and, and the penny pinching and the bean counting and the dollar. Blah, blah, blah. And then having to also face people who look at something and might go, no, that's too much, that's too much. And they're just completely soulless. Like, I always, I want, a, I want another opera house. And now I know it didn't happen easily and I know it was completely kiboshed and there was a whole lot of problems and that as an artist, you know, there must have been so much pain involved. Um, but that's what we have to go back to. But we unfortunately are butting up against like completely like the bureaucrats and things like that that have zero creativity. <laughs> They're living in white boxes every day. Um, and, it's, and it's just bean counting. It's money. That's what's killing it all. That's what's making the biggest issues here is money. All right, so I'm going to be brutal though, but oh. crocheting is not going to solve the housing crisis. <laughs> no, that's true, but it will make you a warm rug to keep you warm while you're sleeping <laughs> on the streets. So it's something, it's a little bit more productive sometimes than some of the things I've come out of some of offices. So I'm not going to name names. No, but I mean, you know, I, you know, there's some things you just go, what are people thinking? But then, yes, when you look at the homelessness issue and, yeah, we're, make, we're building a whole lot more homes, but that's still not affordable for the homeless people and it's still not affordable for the people who need the homes. We don't need more middle-of-the-range things that fill buckets and get more yachts for more rich people. I don't know who to throw to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, please. And please feel free to jump in. Uh, crochet may not be the answer, although symbolically perhaps I think there is a really important role for architects in particular to play in what they've always yearned to do, which is saving the world. Um, and I think it's not to do with each particular job. Uh, most we talk, about, we talk about architecture as though what architects do is respond to a client, go to the council, da-da-da-da-da. But... There is another possibility as well, which is uh, a bigger role of advocacy for how the, how the world, and, and in particular, how cities could be different. And it seems to me that the, um, we're stuck in this kind of impasse of, you know, nobody trusts anybody else. Councils and governments and the populace and the professions all hate each other. Nobody believes in anyone's telling the truth. There's this kind of war which... Um, is, has become part of the culture war. So there's sort of nimbies and yimbies and this generation versus that generation, and it's going to go nowhere. And the truth is we need to, I think we need to subvert that whole battlefield by a means of seduction, which is what architects can do. And architects are the only ones who can do it because they can draw. And also they're the only profession that's actually concerned with the creation of beauty. Nobody else gives a damn about beauty. Nobody else knows anything about beauty. Architects can make it and make it visible to people. And I don't know why the profession isn't out there every day saying to people, this is how the world could look. If you showed how, you know, a missing middle development covering 25 blocks of Liverpool City would look and how it would change people's lives into walkable engaged, community-minded localism, people would fall in love with it. And then all of the legislation and all of the getting engineers in line and all of the money stuff would fall into place because it would be desirable. The minute people desire something, everything will change. And that's up to you guys. Easy, huh, Richard? <laughs> well, you know, I think um, this question of uh, even, even the way we're discussing this... Um, highlights the problem, right? because the architecture is a big, complicated thing. Right? And everyone, the great thing about it is everyone has something to say about it. Right? Taxi driver, your children, best friend, <laughs> right? people you hate. Yeah. Everyone has something to say. And you know what? It's valid. Right? I've very rarely spoken to someone about architecture that they haven't said something that's worth hearing. Right? May not like it. So. That means it's not a question of being deceitful or lacking authenticity. What it means is we have to be able to speak different languages. Right? If, you're, if, you're, if you're talking to the contractor on site who's going to build that wall right, or build that piece of joinery, well, you can't talk to them about you know, the relationship to the sky and, because they're making that thing, but you know, that thing is really important. So that how are they going to make it? And they have something to offer which you can't see, you draw it, but heck, you're not making it, right? So you have to connect. Same with the planner. 
what the heck are they asking that stupid, ridiculous question for? It seems to have no meaning. But, you know, there's something behind that, right? That regulation came out of somewhere. What's that about? That's why architects are not being inauthentic in this way. They do it properly. And this is where it ties into this receding of the ego, right? Because if you can't do that, you're not going to hear anything. Right? And you're right. It's one way to ram it through. Oh, yeah. Fuck off, you build what I drew. <laughs> I mean it, you know, like who deals with I don't I, mean, I would never say, I mean, you know, you go, well, oh, yeah, can, how can we do it better? Look, this is what, you know, what's important here? What do you think we should do, right? That's great what you did over there. Do you know how many people tell them they've done a great job? No one. No one tells anyone. People are shocked when you say it. And together we'll make it better. So you have to not bowl into council thinking they're a bunch of idiots, right, who just graduated and know nothing. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. The words came out of his mouth, and then he thought, oh. Who thinks that, Richard? Yeah. It's a safe place. It's a safe place. Right? You, where, is there, where is the truth that they're speaking? Right? So that, that's the model of the architect as the great integrator. That's the person who can integrate every discourse that's surrounding this complex, amazing thing that we think of as architecture. Um, but where's the visionary? that Elizabeth's alluding to in that. That's the synthesis. The synthesis. That's the amazing thing about being an architect, right? Is that we've been given that task, expectation, yeah. an opportunity. All right, but surely, William, there's a place in here for the visionary that can... The artist that Shannon's alluding to, you know, the Opera House wasn't done by committee. Well, it ultimately was built by committee, but it was not designed by committee. So how do you reconcile this? I mean, I, I think um, let's, uh, whether the architect is a person or a group of people, I think there's a role there to, to uh, curate and refine and develop and document our vision. It's, and that requires input from many people along the way, but I think that's, that's, that is the role. I think we're in the art of making drawing specifications and... Um, you know, helping someone to understand that and then working with a team of builders to deliver that. And uh, that's, that's kind of a great thing. What uh, we often try to do is to tell people about what the vision is and then give them oxygen to make it come to life. And I've had some, you know, one of my favourite um, subbies is a, is a bricklayer called Garris who's in his 70s and I just you know, tell him what the vision is and then leave him alone and he does the most beautiful work. And um, he said to me last week that he's come out of retirement because he found another one of our projects that he could build, <laughs> which is really delightful to, to do that as well. And also to, um, you know, give people an opportunity to shine and do beautiful work um, and make themselves very proud in doing that. Uh, what does Gareth think? There's a brick know what it wants to be or, or what? Uh, I think uh, he, he, cream and green is what he often says. <laughs> cream and green is the favourite way to go. Right, okay. Uh, well, let's bring it back to consciousness then because we've, we've kind of floated off into the architect, the will of the architect, I suppose, for a moment here. But we left this idea of everything has a consciousness. Uh, we kind of haven't touched back on that. I want to know how do we operate with that recognition in mind now. So, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> Look, I, I've, I have some doubt about conscious. I mean, I'm, it's kind of a nice idea, and I think recognition and respect is very important, but whether I really believe that everything is conscious, I'm not sure. I've been ridiculed too many times for su suggesting that, you know, you might as well, um, there's no difference between eating meat or eating a carrot, because a carrot could also have consciousness, which I think is plausible, because carrots, after all, grow after they're picked, and, you know, and kumaras, and, you know, so... Um, they're clearly alive, and that's possible. But it seems to me that re where it really leads is towards a, a level of modesty in architecture. Um, and I think that does relate to the ego thing, the, the reining in of the particular will, um, and, the, and of the idea of self-expression in the interests of expressing something that's bigger, I guess, uh, and so I think Richard said something about, um, and I quite like this idea, it reminds me of an Ed Kelly image of, of the design 
coming through the architect rather than from. And I think it's, it's that whether or not you actually literally believe that, you know, there's consciousness in the chairs, hmm, maybe. But I think we don't have to believe that in order to uh, understand your self and your will as a designer as a part of the big ecosystem and as a as much a listener and a conduit as a creator and an agent. There's a lot in there. I'm coming back to you, Shannon, because I want to I take the creator agent perspective here. Okay. And now I want to know who decides to put the shovel in the ground right there, knowing that as soon as you do that, you are upsetting the ground. How do we put that shovel in the ground? Yes, place is important. Yes, we're in the country, all of those things. But we've got to make progress, a dirty word, but we have to do something. Mm. How? So I saw it's like the last question I asked you, but I want to know, yeah, thanks, put the shovel so. in the ground. Mm. Um, I think we all need to stop and think before we put the shovel in the ground, before we pick the shovel up, do we need another building? Do we need another concrete slab? Do we need another skyscraper? Whatever it is, do we need it? What's the purpose of it? Why is it here? And how is it going to bring something, you know, an act of reciprocity back to communities and back to country and everything that's going to be impacted by that build? And I think that's what we need to do is think more respectfully, more carefully, more reverently, you know, to understand the impacts on everything we do. And I think it's fine, you know, if you eat meat, yes, if you eat veggies, do those things, if you build, if you don't build, whatever. But it's waste and it's taking too much that is, like, at the heart of Indigenous philosophy and interactions with country. Do you need it? Is it wasteful? Are you just going to throw it out? Are you taking from someone or something else? They're the thoughts we have to have before we even put that sort of spade in the soil. But isn't it inevitable that someone is going to lose in that equation? I would, I would say that in this day and age, yes, it's inevitable. Should it be? No. I think actually in other worlds and in other ways of living and being, it's actually not the case that you don't do things that are going to impact other things so widely and so detrimentally. Um, it's a much more um, a respectful and thoughtful way of living for a lot of civilizations, but a lot of communities and a lot of people and places. Yeah. The difference between family or business, it's a big difference. I'm going know? to throw that then to Richard. I'm still stuck on the shovel in the ground question. I'm hearing everything that Shannon's saying. But I still feel like someone in this balance of things, ultimately, we've not found a way to not hurt or damage someone or something. How does the architect even, with all this empathy that you're talking about, how does the architect take the first step? Well, I don't think um, we should see that as such a threshold. Right? I don't think that's a, a real edge because, of course, we disturb everything around us. Right? And the mistake there is thinking you're different to everything around you. You're just part of this flow and adjustment. You know, we, we, we were, we're obsessed with sustainability, right? We're thinking, oh my God, you know, this. what's going to happen? The world's going to be fine. It's us that are going to suffer, mm. right? The world's going to adapt. Everything will flow around. We're not, you know, we can't destroy the place. Yeah. We can cause a big impact. But it will really... We're doing our damn best. It will really affect our quality of life. Yeah. Right? Which we've dug out of this place and want to maintain. Yeah. So, so the problem is thinking you're separate from it. Yeah. Right? And, so, and I think Shannon put it really well. So if this just means you can... I mean, what we're trying to do is think differently. So the consequences of that will be immense. That's it will be that pause. It'll be that... It'll be that pause to such an extent that then it's so imbued in you that the action will be automatic and you'll do a better thing. Mm. Right? So it's really it's just a question of doing a better thing, cause less damage, right? Think, and, and the other thing I would say about consciousness, right, is it's pretty tyrannical being this thing inside the head that's me and different from everyone else and fuck, you know, it's all mine and shit, what am I going to do? And in the end I'm going to die, that's going to be terrible. <laughs> won't be me anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like, not like it's a great space, right? It's not like, so how do you deal with that? Being a, being a fucking eomaniac and like, you know, that makes it even worse at the end, doesn't it? You're even less. Can I super quickly add something oh, to that, please. Richard? What oh, my God, said? please. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to cover it off. I thought you'd finish. 
when you were talking about, yes, you know, the world will live on, but humanity will be gone, and our chances will live here. I heard a, a beautiful Indigenous woman a few weeks ago speaking. I wish I could pronounce her name, but I can't. Um, and she said, but country will miss us. We are just as much a part of country as everything else. And why aren't we respecting what keeps us alive? You know, is, what is it? Is it self-torture? Is it like, do we want a long, slow death or something? But country will miss us. We care for country, and then country can care for us. So if we're gone, who's left to care for country? What's going to happen with our, you know, these intel we're intelligent beings that can give back, and what do we choose to do? Just keep taking it. Yeah. So the role is the caretaker. Yes, the custodian, the guardian, the caretaker. Absolutely. Was it visionary? I don't think so. I like visionary ideas, like yes. And you have to be visionary in order to get past these humanity you know, these things we're thinking about with humanity. How are we gonna survive? What are we gonna do? Can we damage? Can we not? What should we take? And all the rest of it. it has to be visionary. And we are, we're visionary. It's what we do, we all are. But yeah, I think we really must come back to how are we looking after everything around us? That's a good place. Unless anyone from the panel wants to add to that, I'm going to turn around and look at the audience now. I dare you to ask a question. Um, let's start down here. I think we've got a microphone for you somewhere in the room. Spirit, if you got that. Okay. I can't give you the microphone because last time I did that, I never got it back. So we've got a spare one coming your way. Here we go. I'm nervous. This is an esteemed crowd, so I made notes. Um, so one of my good friends is in the back row. She's an engineer. Don't hold that against her. Um, and she texted me in the middle of this presentation. Um, I think William was speaking at the time. And she said, her name's Isabel Duffy. <laughs> and she said to me, will you return to architecture after this? And um, I guess she knew that I'm an idealist and that there's a discovery and a curiosity at the moment is maybe a little bit unsated and that I have a willful act of determination um, and feel that sense of responsibility, which we all talk about, and the advocacy of our profession. And I wrote back, I love our idealism. I just don't know how I best or where I best help my species of architects reach a new level of consciousness. And I think when I reflect on this discussion, of which maybe I align best with Elizabeth, <laughs> um, the paradigm shift of how we influence others to our cause is what I think is missing. And I don't want to say that this is a circle jerk of architects because I also froth on that. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's not about... For anyone over 35, we can yeah, explain sorry. the language later on. I'm, I'm yeah. cusping. Sorry. I'm cusping. Um, but it's, consciousness is not maybe about an individual practitioner or not about a singular practice, but it's about the ecosystem, which we've spoken about. So how do we best ignite a fire under those people who are not architects? That's a question. How a change. That's, that, that's a, question. a question. Who are you directing it to? Anyone who will take it. Who would like to take that? I think you've been to nominate someone. Oh, I'm, I'm, I might yeah. just start to say, like yesterday, I had a meeting with a client and said, would you mind if we make your house carbon neutral in construction and in operation? That's probably a starting point, isn't it? Like carbon is one part of sustainability or working with country. And they said, yes, like, tell me how. And we had a conversation. I think that's, that's an example of a small start in, in moving towards something that's more conscious. Um, yes, so look, I uh, think this is a very important question, of course, because I absolutely believe that advocacy is what we need to be doing. I uh, have run two election campaigns, unsuccessfully, but for that reason, really, because I think that we really need to be speaking about these things in a big way across the whole culture, and we need to take people with us. And I, th my plea to people to imagineer the future and do that in a public way was genuine. But I also, I should say, I also am in the throes, this is not an advertisement, but I am in the process of setting up a little not-for-profit organisation, which anyone is welcome to come and help with, um, which is called the Better Cities Initiative, with a purpose to do, to do exactly that, so that we uh, can have these conversations which are great, but should be able to be had, and should be had, in the big world with real people who can 
make decisions, fall in love, follow, you know, persuade everybody to change direction. And I think that, I think it's possible. I think we have the power to, that seductive capacity to really make that happen in a way that if you try and do it through changing zoning laws and changing this, it's going to be, is so hard and so dull and everyone just dies of boredom in the meantime. Um, but if you can do it with, through imagination, I think it's possible. And I think it's like a poetic, as I said before, subversion of the whole process. So um, see me after. <laughs> All right, so but I'm going to be the devil's advocate again over here. I mean, that sounds lovely. But we have none of the money, therefore we no, have none of the power. Raising money is the purpose. Why would anyone listen to us? Because we raise money and we make noise and we say things that are... <laughs> Aren't there enough people making noise out there at the moment? There They're not architects. There are people saying a sustainable future can be beautiful and exciting and engaging and what you actually want, much more than you want your own suburban house with seven bedrooms and a hundred square meter, linear metres of wardrobe. Like, that is not, that's miswanting on a grand scale and we're all engaged with it and we need to stand against it. Yeah. Another question, yes. I had a wonderful oh, thought. Oh, sorry. Could we, we get a, a Taylor response. Swift to date an architect? Because that just changes the world. I love that idea. But it truly is true. Social media is the answer. There's no doubt about it. Like, look how much power we have now. The governments across the world are going crazy because they can't control what the general population know and do now, that we're all connected. We can have a huge platform if we want. And it works because I know about Taylor Swift. And I know she's dating a footballer, and I don't care. But I know, because I'm on social media. <laughs> um, a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Great. <laughs> I've got a question, but this setup. Is I that okay? It's a little one. Okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. You really do. <laughs> um, I want to come back to ego. Uh, the, I feel really compelled to invoke the memory of Paul Faleros here. And... Uh, having worked for him in these last eight years of practice, his great goal, often he'd say, my last job will be one that you can't see and doesn't leave a trace. Glenn has often reminded me, and this is, I promise it'll be good, um, that as we have to be human first in order to be good architects. So we need to remember what it's like to feel joy and anxiety and fear and hope and, and surprise in order to create that for others. Um, and the question. And the question, yes. So uh, this is amazing. So I'm just really enjoying this. The, um, we're facing this crisis of relevance. At the same time, we have all the ideas which is the fact that we have the ideas and we need to share them is very much rooted in the fucking ego. So my question is, what, I mean, where the, where the actual fuck do we place our ego in order to progress in a way that's not destructive but also accepting of the fact that we have it? I think that's a sh shit question, I'm sorry, but... Who would you like to answer it? I want to, I think... I think everyone, but <laughs> I want Shannon. I All right. I think ego is really necessary and really important in um, making sure that the intrinsic you is understood and known and that every one of us has that beautiful creativity, that essence of, I don't want to say God, or, but whatever that pure essence is, and that's ego and that is also individual and it's also your, your, you don't just have a right to be an individual, you've got an obligation you bring something very special to the table, every single person. But what you have to understand is you've got to strip back all the layers through the ego to be able to get that out. And that's, I love working in groups because one person has one good idea, 10 has 10. And if you can tap into that pure ego, it's great. I think Glenn's got a question. Yeah, I'm coming to Glenn in a second. Anyone else <laughs> want to pick up on that? Yeah. I, I, well, you yeah, think, um, I, like, I touched a little bit earlier on that, that I think uh, as a profession, we have a lot of potential to make great change because we lead a lot of ideas and buildings in the process. So I think that's great potential. I think where the ego probably uh, can get in the way is if, if that stops you from listening along the way. And I kind of 
you know, earlier we talked about, you know, sustainability and things. I think there's an old way of working which is very mechanical in a way where you just have an idea, build the idea, dispose the rubbish and then, you know, the building doesn't get changed. I feel like where the world's moving to is much more fluid than that, that, that it might grow and evolve and change like nature in its process. I think one of the problems in our profession is that we think we should save the world, actually, and that we think we're so influential and our duty is so big, and, and how are we going to change everything? And that a discussion like this quickly moves to the, yeah, but, you know, the problem's over there, how do we get to those people, it's those people over there, those people, all these people, you know, all these people, how are we going to do it? Because we know, right? We're the ones that know, we can do it. But the problem's over there. When really, what I'm trying to look at is understanding what we do better, right? You know, in actually a kind of smaller way um, without such big ambition. And I, and I think that's maybe a start, right? And before that, it's just stopping and trying to understand it. But I think it's, it's you know, maybe it's the way we're trained, maybe it's because We've got an inflated idea about our influence over the over society that we work for and the community who we report to. I mean, and represent, you know, which we don't. Mm -hmm. But somehow we always think, oh my God, you know, oh, we should get out there and fix everything. But really, we should just figure out what we're doing. Yeah, the nature of what we're doing. Okay, but then, Elizabeth, that just sounds like it's a complete contradiction to your idea of, yeah. of advocacy oh, 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 and when you're great, you're very around. <laughs> so, well. Richard talks small, but he's building the biggest things in Sydney that have been built for years. So, <laughs> mm. so try to think about it. You know, yeah, so, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's the, because it's not about the size of something, right? It's about, uh, and you know, this, you never start from nothing, right? No one, no one can create, you know, it's a ridiculous idea. You know, it's whole, even this idea of a line on a page, I mean, no one can create like that on a blank page. No, you know, you start, this building grew out of this site. Um, and that's, you know, doesn't matter how big or small. Mm. So. I suppose um, my answer to it would be that I think uh, it's not only architects who are obliged to try and save the world. I think we all are, actually. I think all citizens have this obligation, and we all have different things to contribute. But the thing that architects can contribute that nobody else is purposed to do is that imagination and seduction thing, um, sort of bringing it together. It's not that architects have the best ideas. Um, and and uh, I think that ideas are not inherently egotistical. That only if you defend them to the death, as Richard said, this is my idea. And I always think of Harry Seidler there, but um, you know, because because <laughs> we've all probably heard him say that. But um, but I think ideas can be and should be responsive and open-ended and fluid, as William said, and and uh, engaged with the universe in a real and evolving way and that is what will save us from ego but also hopefully save the planet which I, I, I do think is a serious role uh, um, it's not that we're all fantastic and can get out there and we know best and so on it's not I'm not thinking we're the kind of surgeons here I'm thinking that as concerned citizens who have particular skills we have an important obligation which isn't just to your client well said um, I'll come to you, Glenn, but if you don't mind, I'll give you the last word. I want to take one more question from the back of the room. Hand up over there. Um, so we've talked about the will of the architect. Um, do you think that consciousness has a will? Um, and if so, uh, in a word or two words, what do you think that that will is? What an excellent short question. <laughs> uh, Richard, you could start. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, they're, they're intimately connected, those two concepts, right? That uh, um, your, your will, your ego, and a sense of consciousness um, are in a slight struggle. And the idea of seeing consciousness as more a network, right? as more extended, um, is a way out of that. Gets you out of that loop. That's a really short answer, is that? Are we happy with that response? Would you like more? Or? We're happy? Or would you like to throw it to someone else? Uh, anyone who wants to... 
I would have said yes. consciousness and will are almost polar opposites, actually. Um, but I, it, you know, people have personal definitions of these. But for me, will implies ego and a purpose to make that ego uh, effective in the world. Um, and consciousness suggests a kind of openness and responsiveness to other, to the other. So I think they're kind of opposed, possibly still in a struggle, but kind of opposed. Well, I apologise for being the last speaker here tonight. I thought I'd be able to hide in between all of you, uh, the rest of you. Um, I spoke with Richard a little bit before we came in here about this subject, and uh, I practice in offices, worked in offices until I was 33, and then went into private practice. This is a comment, and there's going to be some more to it as well. Uh, so hang on. Um, the reality for me was that I saw practices uh, having to make money. I had to survive. And as they survived, wanted to survive better and better. And as they got better and better at surviving, the work got lesser and lesser, the quality. And so... I decided to go into my own practice and work in my own way, where I felt I could have time to think, time to be able to give to thought processes. And in the early part of my career, and towards, I suppose, my 40s, I came in connection with one of our speakers here, Miss Elizabeth Farrelly, who had written on a number of my works. And Elizabeth may or may not remember, but we discussed the process of thinking. And at my view at the time, had started to develop in the notion that we don't create anything. The notion is we are that of discoverers. And I have thought ever since that the creative aspect of our work is the process through which we discover. And to discover eliminates the ego. And that is a critical aspect. And it does not eliminate the joy. It actually increases the joy and the beauty. We haven't spoken about tonight the subconscious. The subconscious, to me, is as important as the conscious. The conscious gives us the rationale to understand what we have to achieve. The subconscious goes into a realm that's deeper and has been able to work things that is a discovery. Things come out. You start drawing. You don't have to think about the line. Things emerge in three dimensions in the mind. And it is the most beautiful, beautiful quality. It is about the reverie, that state between sleeping and waking. And so my practice has allowed me to be able to think in a very different process. The ego is extremely important, but this ego of self is the most damaging. The ego that's the driving force is the critical one that allows one to be able to do things, to be able to get things done. One doesn't have to run shod over everybody else to do it. It's just a process. So my view is that subconscious, the reverie, the state of discovery, the lack of ego are all elements in the process of designing work that has the potential to be beautiful. And it is the understanding of the poetic and the rationale that comes through the subconscious that is the critical issue for me. And so I make the comment that it's far more than conscious, ego, and the likes that we've been discussing. There is the subconscious, which is far deeper and far more important than any of those other things. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. I'm going to turn that into a, the last question for the panel, just taking from that. If we've established that consciousness is there in some way, shape or form, what about the subconscious? 
<laughs> Let, you started this, Richard, so I'm going to throw to you first. <laughs> okay, so I think that um, with consciousness, there's a certain awareness of being separate, a certain, a certain self-awareness. When there's anxiety about that, that's when ego steps in. When it's driven by a certain anxiety, a discomfort of being separate from everything else, all those decisions you've got to make, all those things you've got to prove. When you are in the flow, right, when you are connected with an artistic uh, act, or when you're listening to a work of art, when you're listening to music, or you, all that recedes. Right? That sense of separateness dis disappears. You maybe move into a slightly more subconscious state claim, but I think at that point you're hyper-aware, actually. You are hyper aware, right? devoid of a obsession and anxiety of self identity. And that is the flow. Right? And everyone in this room has been in that space. We, it's a pretty hard space to stay in, but it's an amazing feeling. And, then, and it's not an ego driven thing, it's not your work that comes out of that. Shadow. Well, I think um, subconscious and consciousness actually go hand in hand. That and that when they're in a perfect balance is when you're in that flow state. You're in the physical realm, you're creating something, but it's your subconscious that is allowed to like lead the way and, and inform you in ways that you can't make sense of. And so when you have that beautiful balance, it's when you, you just feel at one with the work, you feel at one with the ideas, the country, the whole thing, and you just can't fail. The two go hand in hand. We're spiritual and we're physical and we're subconscious and we're conscious. And all of it in perfect unison is the magic that we look for every day. Well, I, the subconsciousness for me is probably a bit like we've talked about here in a state of design. It's kind of a feeling through the process. But also, I witness it in a city as well. Like to walk around a place, there's subconsciously I kind of feel good in places. And I don't know how to put my finger on it. It's the bit about that quality part that I was talking of earlier. Elizabeth, the importance of the subconscious. Uh, so, <laughs> I, for me, what's more interesting than the subconscious is the unconscious, and in particular the idea, the Jungian idea of the collective unconscious, which I think uh, is a source of much of our, if you want to call it this, dreaming that, that we share. And I think it's, um, I think of it as, as, you know, like a, the chains of ponds in the Australian landscape, where they sort of run, un where the water runs under the ground, and they, it sort of bubbles up to the surface here and there, and it's still running, but you don't see it mostly. And it's a bit like that, and it's something that we share, and can all tap into, and is a very rich source of imagery and symbolism and um, sort of spatial wealth. <laughs> but I want, um, I was actually just listening to the discussion about design process and how what, where design comes from and stuff, and I was suddenly thinking of, uh, this is perhaps a slightly um, <clears throat> uh, less of, slightly frivolous note to end on, but I uh, remembered interviewing uh, Wolf Pricks from Co-op Himmelblau in Vienna in about 1984, uh, April 1984, in fact, and they took me all around Vienna in this kind of open-top 2CV saying, look at all this amazing work that we've done, you know, which is all this weird stuff kind of emerging out of the top of this beautiful eight-story kind of very serious apartment buildings. And uh, we went back to the office and I said, so tell me about your design process, because I was young and had to write something about them. <laughs> and Wolf Prick said, well, we just, we drop some acid. <laughs> <laughs> we close our eyes and we draw something. And then when we stop tripping, we open our eyes and then we build it. <laughs> That's how it looks. Right, can we get that into the practice notes? <laughs> that would be great. Thank you for that, and thank you for the comment that sparkled that, Glenn. Uh, and that's all we have time for this evening. Um, I want to leave you with a little note. Uh, when I was doing a little bit of background on consciousness, I was reading that actually current quantum physics has a way of describing the tiniest little subatomic particles that are in two states at once in our brains, which they are now mathematically connecting to the cosmos. So whether we like it or not, 
physics, quantum physics, is actually telling us that our consciousness is completely connected with the largest of cosmological um, uh, scales, and they are mathematically proving that now. And I read that in Popular Mechanics, so I know it's true. Good for that. With that, thank you very much, everyone, for coming this evening. A round of applause for our wonderful panelists.